A few years ago, an old friend of mine bought a house and was looking to give away his old trailer home. When he offered me the place, I couldn't refuse. A free trailer? All I had to do is pay lot rent? Hell yeah, I'll take it. I moved in, did some minor repairs, and a couple of weeks later, invited my father and stepmother over for dinner. My stepmother calls herself an old soul, and she claims to be spiritually sensitive. She walked in, took one look around the place, and said, This place has bad vibes. I don't like it. Every time she came to visit, she would nervously look up and down the hallway and simply could not relax. She finally stopped coming over entirely, saying that the air was too thick for her, whatever that means. I thought she was nuts, but now I know she's not. During my time living there, I had some very strange things happen. I saw apparitions out of the corner of my eye, I heard voices, felt cold spots, etc., but I chalked it up to bad lighting, outside noise, and bad insulation. Rational explanations. Until that night. The night that changed my entire belief system forever. I was lying in bed when I awoke and noticed a black figure standing in the bedroom doorway. The figure had a head, two arms and two legs, but no eyes. And it was just standing there. I blinked a couple of times to make sure that I was seeing what I thought I was seeing, and I was. At that moment, it physically jumped from the standing position in the doorway over to the bed and landed right on top of me. It held me down so I was unable to move. I could see my wife lying asleep next to me. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. The figure was sitting on top of me. It reached down and started to squeeze the air from my lungs until I couldn't breathe. It was literally squeezing the life out of me. There I was, gasping for air, paralyzed and unable to make a sound. Just when I thought I was about to die, a series of intense white lights started flashing all around the room, like strobe lights on steroids. I closed my eyes to shield them from the light. It was that bright. All of a sudden, my body convulsed a couple of times, and then everything stopped. I opened my eyes, and the figure was gone, and I was able to breathe again. I lay there for a while, catching my breath and trying to calm down, too scared to move. Still shaking from fear, I looked over at my phone to check out the time. It was 3 a.m., the witching hour. Needless to say, I did not go back to sleep that night. I cautiously got out of bed so as not to wake my wife, and I turned on every light in the place. Every single one, including all the bedroom lights. How my wife didn't wake up, I still don't know, but thankfully she didn't. I made a pot of coffee, grabbed my Bible, and sat at the dining room table until morning light. When my wife woke up, I asked her if she had seen or heard anything strange in the night. She said no, and I left it at that. I didn't tell her what happened, and I still haven't. She probably wouldn't believe me anyway. My wife and I lived in that trailer for about two months after that. When we got the opportunity to rent an actual house, we took it. On the last day that we were ever in that trailer, while packing up, my wife accidentally left the vacuum in that back bedroom. She asked me to go get it. Upon entering the room, a weird sense of dread fell over me, and something told me that I needed to get out of there, fast. I grabbed the vacuum, ran down the hall and out the front door as fast as I could, slamming the door behind me. I then turned around and screamed at the trailer, You want this place? You can have it. I'm gone. My wife looked at me like I had lost my mind. Several of my friends, my father and stepmother, all helped us move. My stepmother insisted that all the vehicles containing our belongings were driven over bodies of water to block any bad juju from coming to our new house. We did that, and we haven't had any experiences in our new house. Well, that's my story. I don't really care if you believe me or not, because I know for a fact it happened. I worked the graveyard shift in a prison that was built in 1910 and saw many spooky things. Chairs moved on their own, doors slammed when no one was around, and I would see people in the hallways when I knew I was alone. 
Nothing really surprised or scared me. After all, it was a hundred-year-old prison, and they used to do regular executions there. There was a lot of violence. It was a maximum security prison until the late 90s. So, of course, some paranormal stuff is going to happen. There was a ton of negative energy within those walls. Like I said, I wasn't really spooked by anything, just a little startled by it all. That is, until one night. I was on the A unit, which is four stories high, with 45 cells on each tier. That makes for a fairly long hallway. I was the only officer on the unit at the time, and it was maybe 2 a.m. There is a B unit officer and a rover that went back and forth between A and B to help us out. The rover was at unit B. So there I was, doing my hourly tier check, making sure that everyone was in their cell and still breathing. I was on the second tier, halfway down the row, when I heard footsteps behind me. I turned around expecting to see the rover trying to catch up with me. However, when I turned around, I saw nothing, and the footsteps stopped. Weird, but I kept doing my checks. And then I heard them again, this time maybe five to ten feet behind me, and going at my pace. Again I turned around and saw nothing. I shrugged it off as possibly the echo of my own boots and once again continued on. I got up to the third tier and the boot sounds are still stepping strong behind me. Now, I'm a history buff and I know that rubber-soled shoes weren't invented till around the 1890s and even then they weren't commonly used on shoes until well into the 60s or 70s. And these footsteps were a loud clacking sound, like leather-soled dress shoes the kind that officers wore in the 20s and 30s before they had rubber-soled tactical boots. None of the officers on the night shift ever wore loud boots. We always wore noise-dampening rubber soles because it was at night. When that realization hit me, I stopped in my tracks and just listened. Click-clack, click-clack. Maybe five seconds of silence went by, then... Click-clack, click-clack, click-clack. It got faster and louder, as if someone was running towards me. Then, boom! It stopped right in front of me. I was so scared, I didn't move a muscle. I just stood there. Then I heard a voice, like a whisper, but with a tone of anger. It said, Why are you out? As if I were an inmate, and I wasn't supposed to be out of my cell. But nothing and no one was around me, except for those sleeping inmates locked in their cells. I noped my ass right out of there and back to the officer's desk, and I stayed there for the duration of my shift, just trying to make sense of it all. The rover did the rest of my checks for me that night. Great guy. Since then I've discovered that I'm not the only one who's come across Officer Boots, as he's been affectionately named. He's made his presence known to many people, both officers and inmates alike. As a doctor, I've seen a lot of people die, and I haven't noticed anything out of the ordinary. Maybe it's because I'm skeptical, or maybe it's because I'm just too busy trying to stop the death to pay too much attention to what happens when the patient actually dies. However, at one point in my career, I worked at a very old hospital that had a lot of ghost stories attached to it. The hospital was inherited from the Catholic Church sometime in the 1970s. During my time there, I had a very strange experience. Since one surgeon needed to be on site at all times, we took turns being there 24 hours on weekdays and 48 hours on weekends. We slept on the top floor of a neighboring house that was inherited from the man that died in it. Access to that house was on the ground floor in the back of the hospital, and only the on-duty doctor and the cleaning staff had a key. On many occasions, we would open up that building to find that bedsheets were on the floor, the TV was switched on, and the refrigerator door was open, even though nobody had been there. Through the years, doctors were woken up in the night by loud knocking on the bedroom door, and when they'd open it, no one was there. One day I was talking about all of this with the nurses, and one of them said, Oh, that's just Mr. Smith, the guy who died in the house. Just tell him to stop doing it. I'm sure he'll listen to you. So, the next time there was loud knocking that woke me up, Having nothing to lose, I called out, Look, Mr. Smith, 
I have to work in the morning. Can you please let me get some sleep? Well, you know what? I was never woken up again in all the years I worked at that hospital. Those nurses told me some other ghost stories, too. At night, patients complained that the nurse wearing the white uniform never responded when they called. The thing is, our nurses wore blue uniforms. The last time any nursing staff at that hospital wore white was back when the church owned it and it was run by nuns prior to the 1970s. Another story is about Sister Mary. She was an elderly nun that used to work in the ward. She died in the 1990s, but apparently never left. Very sick patients that were not expected to survive would speak of an elderly nurse that smelled of roses coming to comfort them in the night, often sitting with them the entire night. None of the family members could see her, only the dying patients. I started noticing the smell of roses from time to time, and when I did, I'd ask the nurses which one of our patients was on the verge of death. And sure enough, each time the smell of roses came, we lost a patient during the night. That hospital and the on-call house have both been torn down to make room for newer buildings, so maybe Mr. Smith and Sister Mary can find some peace now. Or maybe they're still hanging around. Who knows? I haven't been back in a while. I work as an EMT paramedic. Around 3 a.m. one night, we were dispatched for a medical alarm, one of those life alert buttons. A lot of the time, those things are accidentally activated. The alarm company reported to the dispatcher that they were not able to make verbal contact with the resident when they called. So we pulled up to the house, and it was pitch black inside. We were told that there was a key in the garage to get in the house. We found the key and made our way inside. A police patrol unit also responded to the call as we were entering the house, so we all went in together. We turned our flashlights on, and the place was packed with these creepy porcelain dolls, stuffed animals, and a lot of other knickknacks. We yelled out, Paramedics! And we heard the voice of an elderly man yelling that he was upstairs. We went upstairs and found the man on the floor with cuts all over his arm. We started asking him the usual questions like, how did you fall, how long have you been there on the floor, etc. He said that he was on his way to the bathroom when he lost his balance and fell. He then began apologizing to us for how the house looked. He told us that his wife of over 50 years had recently died, and he was still too heartbroken to put away any of her things. After a quick assessment, we lifted him off the floor and sat him on the bed. I began to bandage his arm when he asked me, Dear... How did you know to come to my house? I told him we received the life alert call. He gave me a curious look and said, But I don't have my life alert button with me. It's downstairs, and so is my phone. I wasn't able to call anyone for help. I'm here all alone. He said he had no idea how we were contacted. Weird. Super weird. The police officer on scene and I went downstairs together while my partner stayed upstairs with the man. We found the life alert system and the phone. The operator was still on the line. I told her that everything was okay and he was receiving help. I then asked her how she received the alert since it said in our notes that there was no verbal contact made and the guy didn't have his button or his phone with him. She said no, the note was wrong. When she called back to make sure that the alarm wasn't set off accidentally, an older female answered the phone and said that her husband had fallen, hurt himself, and needed help. But the man's wife had been dead for at least three months, and he was home alone. I have multiple witnesses that can back up this story. I'm a cop and had this experience years ago. It was so intense, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was off duty, yet armed. Normally I don't carry a gun when off duty. One night I was walking through a tiny strip mall parking lot. This place had maybe six or seven stores. For no discernible reason, I started thinking about tactical actions I would take if one of the stores in the mall was being robbed. Now it's not that unusual for a cop to pre-plan such things. 
But then my feelings got super intense. It felt to me as if something actually was going to happen. It got so strong that I unsnapped the holster and put my hand on my gun, just in case I needed to draw quick. My hand stayed in that position until I got to my car. Then I waited a minute longer, looking at the stores, just in case. I was on high alert. I finally shook it off, got in my car and drove home, wondering why I had gotten myself into such a state. The next day, reading the newspaper headline, I saw that a double homicide took place in that very parking lot, literally two minutes after I drove off. I called a buddy at the police station and I was told the exact location of the murders, and it was the next parking aisle over from where I was parked, literally a hundred feet away from me, Max. That one haunted me for quite a while, wondering if I could have done something to save those victims. In reality, I probably couldn't have stopped anything. The suspect ambushed his ex-wife and former mother-in-law during a custody exchange in the parking lot. But had I been there, it surely would have resulted in a shootout with this guy after he killed them. There was a guardian angel with me that day that got inside my head and made sure that I was ready for anything, even though ultimately I couldn't save anyone. This happened when I was a teenager. My parents were gone for the weekend, and they had a memory foam mattress on their bed that was a lot more comfortable than my mattress. They had a rule against us kids sleeping in their room. But I decided that I was going to enjoy that comfortable bed, even though I knew they hated it when we did that. I figured who would know I was alone in the house. I settled in to go to sleep and felt immediately uneasy. I have anxiety, so I just told myself I was feeling off because of the new surroundings, and that once I fell asleep, I'd be fine. I turned on the TV and watched some old cartoons to calm down. Once I was ready to go to sleep, I turned off the TV, put the remote by the nightstand by my head, and rolled over to go to sleep as best I could. I woke up sometime later with the light from the TV shining in my face and the cartoons playing again. I was confused, but figured I must have fallen asleep without ever turning the TV off. I glanced at my phone, and it had just been 45 minutes since I went to sleep, so I turned the TV off again, put the remote back on the dresser, and went back to sleep. But I was woken up again by the sound of loud voices. I realized that the TV was back on, and this time, the volume was incredibly loud. I had it set pretty low before going to bed. I lay there for a minute, confused about how the TV got back on and the volume cranked up. And I noticed that the channel had changed. It definitely wasn't the same channel I left it on before going to sleep. I again reached for the remote, only to discover that it wasn't there. Suddenly the TV flipped by itself to a horror movie, with creepy music blasting at full volume. Now I was fully awake and feeling around on the floor for the remote control that I figured I must have knocked off the stand in my sleep. I was freaking out due to the insanely loud music and the fact that the TV was turning itself on and flipping channels. I decided to turn on the overhead light to help me look, so I jumped out of bed and took about five steps toward the door when I saw the remote. It was on the floor, pointing in a straight line from where I was standing to where the light switch was. I made a weird sound between a yelp and a cry, turned the lights on and grabbed the remote, turning the volume down to a reasonable level. It had been completely maxed out to a hundred. I noped it out of that room so fast I didn't even turn the TV off. It took me a long time to fall asleep in my own bed after that. I later asked my parents if they ever had any problems with the TV turning on randomly at night, and they looked at me like I was nuts. After that, I never tried sleeping in that room again. Maybe a ghost was making sure that I followed my parents' rules when they were out of town. I'm a Canadian nurse, and one time we had a woman in her mid-30s come into our hospital with end-stage cancer. She had only been in Canada for about six months, having moved from England with her husband and 10-year-old daughter for her husband's job. 
For nearly eight months, she lived with us. The closer to the end it got, all we could do was just make her comfortable. She was the sweetest person and rarely complained, except about a framed picture on the wall of her room. It was a painting of an English cottage in a field of flowers that hung on the wall across from her bed. We all thought she'd enjoy the painting because it was of the English countryside, right? But for some reason, she hated that picture. She made such a fuss and demanded that the picture be taken down. So we complied because we wanted to keep her happy. This lovely lady finally crossed over to the other side and was free from her pain. But almost immediately after her death, any time a patient was admitted into that room and the painting was back on the wall, they'd insist that it be removed. Other patients would comment that the picture was very nice, but somehow unsettling. So we finally took it down for good. During this time, new staff members said they saw a British lady in that room when they worked the night shift. Some were very uncomfortable going anywhere near that room after dark. They said it felt as if they were being watched. We all agreed that our British lady was sticking around. It took more than a year, but our friends seemed to finally move on. But we never put that painting up again. <laughs>